Welcome. The sun is shining, and it's race weekend. How many of you had to cross a different bridge and navigate weirdly to get here this morning? Yeah, well, glad you made it. And uh, as people continue to come in, uh, half of Westboro shut down this morning because crazy people are running and running and running. So... Um, but we're here this morning, and I'm standing, and you're sitting, and that's okay. Um, but I want you to engage in your minds. We're going to exercise this morning as we finish up our series uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, speaking of exercise, uh, many of you know I've been working with the Iron Viking. And uh, I call him that because I don't want you to know who he is. Because if you care about me, you, you, you aren't going to like him. Because I don't like him. And I tell him that every time I see him. And last week, we actually were away. And we, we were at a conference, Ruth and I, and we were able to go out east. And, uh, and I loved it. I, he said, have a great vacation. I'll miss you. And I was like, I don't, I'm not going to miss you. See you. Bye. And then we went to Halifax. And I had um, fish and chips. Because that's what you do in Halifax. I had lobster rolls. Because that's what you do in Halifax. And I repeated that <laughs> daily. Because that's what you do in Halifax. So when I came home and we went back to see the Iron Viking in his dungeon in the basement. He calls it a gym. I call it a dungeon. He asked how our trip was, and he has this way, kind of like my mother. He looks me in the eyes, well, he looks me in the eyes, and he said, so, did you cheat? And I said, Ruth did. <laughs> and then he said, did you? And I was like, yeah. He goes, extra sets today. So I feel like I've been riding a bike without a seat for miles and miles and miles. So this morning, if I all of a sudden just kind of crumple like a wilting flower, blame the Iron Viking. It's reminding me now that I am 40. I do not bounce back from working out like I used to. There was a time in my life where all I had to do was think about exercise. And those of you who are a little bit older, you know what I'm talking about. You just think about exercising, and you young people know exactly what I'm talking about. You study in front of the mirror, you think about exercising, and you just bounce into shape. I'm not that anymore. My body, as much as I'm trying to take care of it, is starting to show its age. My hair is starting to thin. My beard, if I grow it out, it's getting snowier and snowier. We just, by, by whether we like it or not, right, we are all susceptible to gravity and time. It's just part of our world. But it wasn't always part of our world. And the Bible actually says that it won't be part of the new world one day. We're continuing our series, like I said, uh, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the resurrection of Jesus and why that is so important. And we've been traveling through this chapter where the Apostle Paul talks to a group of early Christians in the first century, and he is trying to get them to wrap their brains around and to wrap their lives around the reality that Jesus not only lived and died for our sins, but he he rose victorious bodily from the grave. And this is the first fruits or the beginning, the revolution of God renewing all things in his son and through his son, Jesus. And that includes everyone who is a follower, who is found in Christ, who is trusting in him as the payment for their sins and their death. And because we are united with him in those two things, we also are united with him in his resurrection. 
And this is important because the church in Corinth, much like the church today and, and just people in general today, we have this uh, dichotomy between the physical and the spiritual, between what we can touch and see and smell and all those things and what we can't. And often we, we divorce what we do with our bodies and our bodies themselves with, with who we are. And the reality is, is God has made human beings as whole people. That what we do with our bodies affects our spirits and our emotions, our mind, our will. And, and, and what we do with those also affects our body. And that God did not create us to live as these ghosts or these ethereal spirits and many of us in pop culture and even in Christianity, we, pro pro we push this view that somehow that the physical is bad, it's temporary, but the, but the spiritual is good. That's not Christianity. And so growing up as a teenager, as a kid, I hated the idea of, of heaven as it was culturally presented. And, and quite frankly, how it was often talked about in, in Christian circles and at funerals. Like, like absent from the body, present with the Lord, which is a biblical concept. But it's a temporary thing. It's a temporary thing in the fact that God says that we will be changed. That we will get new bodies and that we'll get a new world and we'll have a physical eternity now some of you are like oh man i don't know if i want a physical eternity the idea of escaping this shell actually sounds really good well here's the cool thing as pastor tim looked at last week we get new shells and we're going to continue in that today because we are being prepared for a new place. And we're going to wrap up this series this morning. We're going to hit hard the, the, the glorious impact that the resurrection of Jesus has for us, both in the future, but also for today. So if you got your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're looking at the last eight verses today, verse 50 to 58. Let me pray and then we'll... We'll look at it together. There's three big ideas that I want to pull out this morning for us uh, from this chapter or from this section of this chapter. And uh, then we can get out and enjoy the sun knowing that the physical, beautiful world that God has created, it's marred today just as we are. But one day it's going to be completely and utterly glorious and perfect I already have a deal with the Lord that I'm going to spend the first thousand years of eternity in Hawaii by myself. I had a friend who's like, well, I, well, you know, I want to go to Hawaii too. And I said, well, you can go to another island and every hundred years we'll wave to each other. That's only the first thousand years. Don't worry. We have forever. It's going to be awesome. Let me pray. We'll look at it together. Father, thank you for a beautiful spring day. And Lord, we were reminded of just the beauty of your creation, just the wondrous works of your hands. It's an expression. The reality is, Lord, you spoke everything through your son into existence. Out of your beautiful, amazing mind came all of the beauty and wonder of this world. And so we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of, of, of the physical reality that we can taste and see and smell and create and use and enjoy. And yet, Lord, we know we, all we have to do is flick on the news or wait till February. We know that our world is broken. And yet there's something inside of all of us that's broken too. And we long for the day where things will be made right and new and perfect. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the first fruits of the promise that he is, that you are making all things new. And that in him, we too will experience glory and all the fullness that that is meant to be. And so this morning, as we look into your word, tune our hearts and our heads and our eyes and then our lives to this wondrous, awesome reality. Just pull us out of this temporary 
momentary life. That we see the grandeur of who you are and what you've done in Christ. That we would live uh, with excitement and expectation for all that you have in store. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He starts like this. The Apostle Paul is talking to a group of Christians in Corinth. And he says this. I tell you this, brothers and brothers here, ladies. It, it's, 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 it means brothers and sisters. I tell you this, brothers and sisters. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So I said there's three things this morning. Here's the first one, okay? Jesus' resurrection means one day. One day, there is a day coming. The Bible refers to it as the day of the Lord, okay? Where Jesus is going to return publicly. This day is coming, and this one day, we will be changed from decay, wasting away our physical bodies. We will change from decay like he has been, like him. Jesus' body was not left to decay. He was put in the grave, and three days later, he rose again with a glorified body. And we, even though we are wasting away on the outside, are being renewed day by day. And one day, when he returns, we will all be changed and given glorified bodies. You see that? It comes right out of the text. He says right there in verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why. That's why we all got to be changed. Flesh and blood here, uh, flesh often in the New Testament has this idea of, of the fallenness. It's not really our physical bodies, though that's, the appetites are, are expressed through our physical bodies, but the flesh has this idea of that which is contrary to the Spirit of God. It's our old uh, carnal flesh nature. Now here, flesh and blood and cannot, cannot is singular, meaning flesh and blood go together as a unit. When flesh and blood are talked about together in the Bible, it's talking about just our physical bodies. Okay, so it's not the sinful part. That's why it, not why it can't inherit, though that's true theologically. The reason we can't inherit the kingdom of God and all of God's new creation in our physical bodies that we have now is because they are wasting away. We need new bodies for the new world. You don't want to show up at the new world with an old body. It's not cool. Trust me. Have you ever showed up somewhere with the wrong body? I know it's a weird question. I usually show up at the wrong place with the wrong body. But there was a day where I showed up at the right place with the right body. Africa. Let me explain. In Africa, portly means wealth and fertility. And in Ethiopia, I was a heartthrob. <laughs> you have no idea. You can ask Tim later. This is no joke. We went to visit this community. 
and I'm standing there. We're watching these kids play soccer, and all of a sudden, I hear these cat calls. No joke, like cats. But they weren't cats. They were 14-year-old girls. And there was a whole group of them, and they were calling at me. And I was like, I have a mind. I am a person. And it actually got really awkward, and we were traveling with my, my friend Janet, and, and, uh, and I actually said, like, Janet, can you kind of just, like, stand beside me and, and, like, you know, make me feel safer? <laughs> that doesn't happen here. I know you're shocked, but it honestly doesn't happen here. I walk down the street, nobody's paying attention to me. You know, I go to the beach, and people are more like, oh. But in Ethiopia... Right place, right body. <laughs> and so just in case you're wondering, new heaven, new earth, new body. Glorified, perfect eternity. Glorified, perfect body. We will be made for this new world that's coming. And theologians go nuts with this stuff, right? Because we only have glimpses of it, okay, throughout Scripture. Thomas Aquinas believed that all of our bodies would be at the physical peak of who we are, okay? So, so most people, uh, and, and he, he, he studied this, and they've gone even further now with science. There's a point in our bodies where we continue to grow, 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 and then... And we all know when that is. And then we start to go, bup, 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 bup. And so Aquinas believed that right at that moment where we like come into full fruition of all that our DNA has made us to be, he believed it was 25. So if you're 25 here, congratulations. It's almost over. <laughs> all right? So, so whether you die at 80 or whether you die at... Eight, Thomas Aquinas believed that we would all be at that place, that we would be at 25. We'd be able to recognize each other, but we'd be the, the perfect version of ourselves. Theologians will go even further and say that we're going to be like the resurrected Christ and that you know how he would show up? He'd be like, the disciples would be like in a locked room and then all of a sudden his body would just be there? Like, I don't know you, like, if you like science fiction, this is like your wheelhouse, right? You're like, this is awesome. You're like, beam me up, all right? And all that stuff. Even if you're not, that's kind of cool. Like, all of us are going to be doing grand entrances all the time. And you'll be like, I want to be on the beach today. And boom. I don't know if that's really part of it, okay? But these are the kind of things. The point is, is the new heavens and the new earth, we will be perfectly made, changed to be a part of that world, that perfect world. It sounds awesome. Awesome. And you notice this, he, he wants to really iterate this. He's like, Jeff, you know what, you're... you're you're going off on all this kind of physical stuff, man. Like, this is church. We got to be all, like, ethereal and theological. and You know, like, this is just way too rudimentary. That is Greek philosophy. That is not Christianity. Christianity is physical and real. It's whole. And look at how important this is to the Apostle Paul. Verse 50, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, it's emphatic Okay, he's like, look, look, I want you to get this. This is real. This is going to happen. Get it. And he goes on even more so in, in the version that I've got. It says, behold, in verse 51. He's like, I want you to get it. This, this new kingdom of God, this, the new heavens, a new earth, you as you are cannot be a part of it. God's got to make you for this new world. He's got to change you for it. It's perfect and you're not. But God's going to change you for it. Get it. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now here, sleep is a euphemism for death. He's saying, look, we're not all going to die absent 
from the body present with the Lord. Some of us are going to be alive when the Lord returns. Now, you could be thinking, okay, so dead people, we get it. Dead people, they decay, they die on the ground. Of course they're going to get new bodies because their bodies are, you know, kind of dust. But, but you can see from the Corinthians' point of view, this is a mystery. This, this is something that God has revealed. It's not something that Paul solved, solved. It's something that's been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, this reality. And, and you can imagine that the Corinthians, the first time they heard this, they're like, okay, I want to die because I want this new body. And if Christ comes back and I'm still in this body, dang, does that mean I'm going to be walking around in, in, in the new earth with like, like the old iPhone version of myself? Like everybody's upgraded and here I am like old school? And that's why he says, no, 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 no. We will all be changed And I love this, verse 52, it says, in a moment. The word for moment there is one that you would recognize. It's atomos, from which we get our word, Adam. He's trying to to bring it down. Literally, it's like the smallest possible second we will be changed. You notice that he uses another way to describe it, in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? So, Faster than your lover can bat her eyelashes at you, you will be changed into the new, perfected, glorified you. And you notice that this is going to happen at the last trumpet. Now, we don't have time today to unpack all of that, and I'm kind of giving you like, like the big mountain version, okay? Bob Evans is a guy who's here today, my father-in-law. There's other people you could talk to who's kind of studied this and, and can kind of break down the incremental way that all of this is going to happen. Paul here doesn't go, go there. He kind of just gives the big picture. The last trumpet is, is, is not like there won't be any other trumpets, but it's the point of like the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and, and that is like the end of this age. And Jesus will return. And he will make all things right. And that is where we in Christ will be changed for this new world. You notice he reiterates it again, verse 53. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on the immortality. See, the new world's going to last forever, and we need bodies that are going to last forever too. You know, I got a call this week from my dad. He borrowed my van, and uh, I'm, I wanted him to say, can you leave it in an alley with the keys in the ignition and the door's unlocked? Don't come back. He texted me last night, and our van's 11 years old now. So um, every time we go out somewhere, it's, it's kind of a gamble whether we're going to be coming home in the van. And he borrowed it to go, go visit my nanny. And uh, he texted me last night going, okay, the car won't start. I got it towed. Needs a new battery. And then I got a text like a few minutes later, and he's like, um, so it wasn't the battery. The car now won't, still won't start. You probably need an alternator. And so I'm just waiting to see how much this is going to cost me for, to get my van home. Anybody want to buy a van? <laughs> it's breaking down. It's falling apart. It's, it's kind of run its, its, its way. And um, I need a new van. And some of you are like, my body is kind of, it's done its thing, it's, it's, but I'm ready. I'm ready for a new, new body. You know, Tim shared last week, and I unplugged this uh, big time, but to Joni Erickson uh, Tata, who, who uh, as a kid, dove and, and got a spinal cord injury, and, and she's longing for the day where she gets this uh, new body that functions fully, properly, totally, and No other religion offers that. And this idea that we'll physically interact with each other and enjoy each other and enjoy God's creation, not just kind of reach nirvana or become part of the one or any of those kind of things. It's it's the best version of all that God has intended and will bring about.
I love it. Here in, in verse 53, you notice there's four times he says this, 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 this. And he's saying this body, this imperishable, this mortal. It's like he wants to make it very, very clear that, that, that this is not going to be that. And I know that's so hard for us in our world today, right? Because we, we just, we're so caught up in the this. Think of, think of how much time we spend on, on trying to, to prolong, prolong the inevitable or put off the inevitable. We have like a complete aversion uh, to, to death. And, 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 and Christians, I get this, we, we mourn the loss, but it's not a loss of I'll never see that person again. It's more like I'll see you again soon. And not just see you again soon, like it's some kind of euphemism for two kind of floating people, like th- spirits in the clouds. But like, I'll see you again soon. I'll see the best of you soon. And you'll see the best of me. It's a hope like nothing else. I love this um, quote. This is from a, a theologian, Anthony Hokema. He said that resurrected bodies are not intended just to float in space or to flip from cloud to cloud. They call for a new earth on which to live and work, glorifying God. The doctrine of the resurrection of the body, in fact, makes no sense whatsoever apart from the doctrine of the new earth. And I like this one. Randy Alcorn, in his book on heaven, I encourage you, if you haven't gotten it, if this is... It's exciting. It says this, strangely though, Jesus in his resurrection body proclaimed, I'm not a ghost. Yet countless Christians think they'll be ghosts in an eternal heaven. They think they'll be disembodied spirits or wraiths. The magnificent cosmos-shaking victory of Christ's resurrection by definition, a physical triumph over physical death in a physical world escapes them. If Jesus had been a ghost, if we would be ghosts, then redemption would not have been accomplished. So the reason we're all decaying is because we're all dying. But notice that Jesus' resurrection also one day is going to get rid of all of that too. Look at This is my second thing. So Jesus' resurrection means one day we're all going to be changed from decay like he has been. And Jesus' resurrection means one day we will be champions over death through him. Look at verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, when the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death. Where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. And but, here's a big but. One of these days I'm going to go through the Bible. I'm going to do a study called the big butts of the Bible. All right? It's going to be awesome. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's quoting from Isaiah 25, verse 8. And many, many commentators think he's always also talking about um, Hosea, chapter 13. But I wanted to throw up, this is, this is from Isaiah 25, 8 and 9, okay? This is where Paul's getting this from, okay? It's an Old Testament prophecy pointing to the Messiah and what he's going to do. And look at this, it says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What I want to pull out from that right here is that where it says, for the Lord has spoken. It's like guaranteed, gonna happen. 
going to happen. That's why Paul, with such certainty, can say, on that day, when we change, because he returns, and he's changed, and he comes, and he does that, on that day, everybody's going to be going, where is death? You lose. It's over. How many of you watched the Raptors game last night? Really? Really? I know it's Toronto, but it's the only team, so it's kind of like the Blue Jays. It's allowed, okay? It's not like the Maple Leafs. Your pastor said, it's allowed. We could cheer for Toronto teams if they're the only team in Canada, okay? If the Maple Leafs ever become the only Canadian hockey team, no, we still won't, but, okay? Now, it was amazing. It didn't go to game seven, but... But remember the last series, The Shot? I think that's what they're calling it now, right? And it's like bouncing on the rim. And, and, and you know, I love, like, I wasn't even watching the ball in the replays. I was watching Kawhi, right? He's like sitting over on the side. He's just watching it. And everybody's watching it. And they're just waiting for it to fall. And the cool thing about watching the replays is we all know it's going to fall. But it's still really, really exciting, See, Romans 8, Paul writes and he says, all creation is groaning, waiting, watching for the sons of God to be revealed. It's like like all of God's creation is sitting there just going, when's it going to drop? When's it going to drop? And it's guaranteed. Victory is guaranteed because Jesus has already risen from the grave. Man, can you think about it? Think about it from, from the angel's point of view. On that first Easter Sunday, that's why Sunday we gather every Sunday and, and like let's sing our hearts out in the glorious Jesus is risen from the grave. The ball is guaranteed to drop. The victory is ours. You notice that it says God gives who the victory? Us. Us. Do you want to know how much I contributed to the Raptors winning last night? But I was celebrating like I was a Raptor. Right? And that, that's the thing here. His victory is our victory. And he could quote, and he quotes from hundreds of years before Jesus ever existed. And who knows? It's been 2,000 years But he's promised, he promised to rise from the dead, and he did. And that guarantees that his promise that he will return and he will change all of us and he will make everything right and we will spend eternity with him glorified is guaranteed. And so Paul could say, death, where's your sting? You want to pick a fight with the enemy that wins every time. It's something that it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what time you live. It doesn't matter any of those things, your resources. It doesn't matter. All of us as humans, we cannot defeat death. And Paul says, because of Jesus, death, you got nothing on me. Nothing. And you notice he expounds why. Why? Verse 56, because the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. What? I thought the law was good. I thought God gave the law. See, death in and of itself isn't the sting. Death is kind of like the, the, the result of, of the actual illness. The illness is sin. And the power of the illness is be the fact that the law is there. That's how we know what sin is. The law condemns us. We don't measure up to who God is and what he requires. Heaven is perfect because God is perfect. It's holy and it's forever and it's not marred or broken in any way. And we are. And so the law says you can't go there. You can't be with him. And that's where sin gets its power. And that's why death happens. But Paul's saying here, Jesus, Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law. He lived a perfect life 
and he paid for your sin, so his righteousness is imputed onto you. So now the law, the law doesn't do anything for you. It's nullified. And the sting of death is gone, or the sting of sin is gone. You know why? Because he was stung for us on the cross. He took the sting of our sin, and he took our death, and now in him we have victory. Victory. Love verse 57, it's, it's in the present tense. It, you could actually translate it like this. But thanks be to God who keeps on giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, many of us are living like the victory is going to come someday. And the fulfillment of the victory is going to come someday. But in another sense, we as Christians, part of the revolutions we talked about a few weeks ago, we can live like champions now and live into, as Paul says, the power of his resurrection. There's a quote from John Calvin. He says this, The cross of Christ only triumphs in the breast of believers over the devil and the flesh and sin and sinners when their eyes are directed to the power of his resurrection. He defeated sin and death on the cross. And now we can live in light of that. We're called to live in light of that. The power of his resurrection isn't a quote that John Calvin made up. It's actually from Philippians, but another letter that Paul wrote to another church. He said this, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Everything else doesn't matter because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, garbage, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain resurrection from the dead. See, Paul here in, in Philippians has unpacked all of the reasons why he, he, if it was by the law, how he is better than anybody else. And that's when he says, I count all those things as rubbish compared to knowing Christ. And I want to experience the power of the resurrection, to share in his sufferings. It put a perspective on his life that often I confess I'm not keeping. I get so caught up in, in trying to perform for God and I get so caught up in, in all of accumulating the things for the here and for the now. And yet Paul says here, nothing, it's all garbage that I would be found in Christ. You know that expression, uh, you are what you eat. The Bible would say you are what you worship. And too often I find my affections and the things that I'm chasing after in this world display in me that I'm chasing after the wrong things. But in the resurrection power of Christ, when we chase after and pursue him, we throw off everything else, guess what? He begins to transform us and he is transforming us into the image of his son. N.T. Wright has this uh, cool, um, he, he fleshes this out. He says, when human beings give their heartfelt allegiance to and worship that which is not God, they progressively cease to reflect the image of God. One of the primary laws of human life is that you will become what you worship. What's more, you reflect what you worship not only to the object itself, but also outward and to the world around. Those who worship money increasingly define themselves in terms of it. 
and increasingly treat other people as creditors, debtors, partners, and customers rather than as human beings. Those who worship sex define themselves in terms of it, their preferences, their practices, their past histories, and increasingly treat other people as actual and potential sex objects. Those who worship power define themselves in terms of it and treat other people as either collaborators, competitors, or pawns. These and many other forms of idolatry combine in a thousand ways, and all of them damaging to the image-bearing quality of the people concerned and those whose lives they touch. What he's saying here is what we chase after, what we pursue to, to, to define us. And Christians, listen, we are called to chase after Jesus. And he's transforming us into his image. And then we love the things that he loves. And we see people the way he sees them. And we treat people the way he treats them. And we become more and more like him. Because see, while the outside is waiting to sing away and we're going to be changed on the outside physically, we're getting new bodies. God is currently now, as we pursue after Christ, changing our insides to match these new bodies and one day we will be perfect and reflect him on the inside and the outside which brings me to the last thing this is the third point we'll finish with this Jesus resurrection means not one day but every day we will courageously be continuing to labor for him you notice verse 58 and I love this. Paul doesn't leave this theology as this kind of abstract thing just to think about. It impacts our lives now. Look at this, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See, our theology should impact our orthopraxy. Our right thinking about God should impact right living for God. And the fact that, that we will one day live in this glorified world with glorified bodies, now, now we need to be living in light of that. Steadfast, immovable. See, the Corinthians were prone to being fickle. And I confess we are too. Our heart attitudes, our expectations, our, our, our looking forward to the new heaven, the new earth, our desire and pursuit of Christ seems to rise and fall on how well things are going now. And Paul here is reminding, look, look, look a little bit further. Allow the victory of Christ to impact you here today. Keep your eyes set on what's there so that you can remain stable, immovable. He says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And why? Because it's not in vain. Why is it not in vain? Why is our work for the Lord not in vain? Like this whole world's gonna end anyway. Like what does it matter? Because the things that we invest in the things that are of the kingdom, as Jesus even said, those things, those treasures, they, do, they don't rust. They aren't destroyed. And we can be part of, of working and, and, and bringing in the things that, that are part of the kingdom of God that will continue forever. As we reflect him. You know, there's nothing more tragic than doing a ton of work and then having it all discarded. And this is encouragement for us. And, and again, we live in the Western world. It's really comfortable and everything else. But, but think of these early Christians. Think of Christians across the world, most persecuted religious group in the world by far today. This reality that them remove, staying 
steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the things of the kingdom and of the gospel. Think of those words as they apply and let's apply them to our lives regardless of how much we are persecuted, quote unquote. That living for Christ now is not in vain. It's not in vain. And T. Wright puts it this way. He says, what you do in the Lord is not in vain. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll over a cliff. You're not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown on the fire. You're not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. You are, strange though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world. Every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and the delight and the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care or nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, every word that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world. All of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. And there's nothing more graphic, and that's why I added the word, not just the deeds. Because the reality is, as, t- as Paul started chapter 15, I'm telling you and reminding you what I delivered of first importance. And he goes on to say, the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Because when someone puts their faith and trust in what Jesus has done, God puts them in Jesus And they go from part of this decaying world and the power of sin and an eternity separated from their creator to now spending eternity with their creator and victorious. And so church, we've got a job to do and it's not in vain. It's life and death. And it's worth every moment and every breath. You know, the Iron Viking said when we started training back in January, summer bodies are made in the winter. He's not just a big brute. He's a poet, too. Summer bodies are made in the winter. See, part of the refining of us on the inside, transforming into the image of God so that when we are changed and it all comes together perfectly, it happens now. It happens in the, in, in, in the meantime as we pursue him, as we are are changed to become more like him, as we yield to the spirit and allow the fruit of Christ to be born in our lives that we would reflect him more and more and more. It happens now. It happens now. Paul finishes that that, that part that we were looking at in Philippians. I want to just get this. He goes, not that I have already obtained this, or am I already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And may this be our prayer and our purpose, our priority as well. I'm full. I feel like worshiping God. We're going to stand now. We're going to close uh, with a final song. And I remember, this is, worshiping God is more than just singing, but it comes from a heart and a life that reflects that. And then we go out into the world. Monday's coming, and we can live in the power of the resurrection. Next week, we're starting a new series called Ready for the Sun. I'm so excited. Because Jesus kind of highlights this last trumpet moment and when he returns and what he's going to be looking for. What are we doing in the winter for the summer? Because he is coming again. And we're going to look at at what he is wanting from us in the meantime. Not to earn our way, but because he has made the way and we are running hard 
after him. Let's sing this final song as our prayer and then I'll come back out and close our service.